good. So, um, well, I'm not sure I need to introduce myself. My name is Peter. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and I'm going to tell you about some high resolution ALMA imaging of SMGs. Um, and the, there, there will be an introduction, a very general, uh, and then the work at the end is work I've done as postdoc in Durham, uh, which is why I have the little ERC and the Durham logo up here. Um, oh no, there you go. Okay, so I need to use the mouse, sorry. Um, so a bit motivation, um, SMGs are this high redshift population of galaxies. Why do we want to study them? Um, and the reason is more or less ga galaxy evolution. So if we look in the local universe, we will see a lot of galaxies which are very Milky Way-like. And I know this for some might seem like a very general statement, but it's merely to point out that there's this very rare population uh, of very extreme galaxies uh, known as ULURKs in the local universe. So these would be the one that you, you can't see my mouse, right? Um, so the one in the middle of these five images would be one of these messy galaxies, very bright in infrared luminosity and very messy in structure, compared to the very most bright galaxy, which is a very smooth disk galaxy, very beautiful actually. But the question is, um, the galaxies we see in the universe around us, how do they form and how do they evolve? And how do the extreme galaxies fit into the scheme of galaxy evolution of the more normal star forming galaxies. So if we start with these rare galaxies, the ultra-luminous ultra infrared galaxies, or ULURKs as they're called, they have a very bright infrared luminosity. So there's both LURKs and ULURKs. So the LURKs are slightly less bright than the ULURKs. Uh, they have star formation rates around a, a 50 solar masses per year. They don't contribute very much to the current uh, star formation history, actually less than 1%. Uh, but if, if we look at them, they are still very bright and they have these very messy uh, morphologies with uh, multiple cores and clumps suggesting that these are major mergers and that the major merger event is what causes this burst of star formation uh, and the high star formation rate we see compared to other galaxies. Um, so as I said, they, these are bright in the infrared. So if we look at the distribution of energy in the universe as such, then because we have a high peak in the cosmic microwave background. Um, and then we have a bump at the UV and optical uh, distribution, which is what you would see with Hubble. So here you see, um, you see some gas and you see uh, mostly stars. Uh, and then we have an equally big bump in the infrared. And this is where we find most of the emission we see in ULURKs because they're so dusty that the, the emission from these very bright own B stars, the UV emission, uh, gets, re gets absorbed by the dust and re-emitted in the infrared. So it's basically heating that we see. So we need to go to other wavelengths to study these galaxies in more details. And this becomes very clear if we then compare images um, from optical and UV with infrared and submillimeter. So this is the antenna galaxies. Uh, I'm sure most of you have actually seen these images before. So the, all the blue and the red are star forming regions, very bright and very active. And then you have these dust lanes, which obscuring all the, the emission from these um, stars, so you can't see through it. But if you then go to the infrared or the millimeter and submillimeter, then you start seeing through all these clouds or you actually see the dust in emission instead of in absorption. And then you can actually start probing and tracing uh, this uh, interstellar medium in the clouds um, and start characterizing the, the temperature and the density of the gas that's actually forming the stars. Um, so if we, this means that if we, if we want to study galaxies, we can't just look in one wavelength. We need to kind of cover the spectrum a bit more. So this is a, an SED template um, illustrating that if you need to use both Hubble, Herschel, Spitzer, uh, the um, JCMT is here representing the millimeter and submillimeter. And if you want to go to radio, you need to go to, uh, to VLA uh, or something similar. So we need to kind of probe the full spectrum to, to be able to say anything about these high rigid galaxies. Um, so the, the question is, ULURKs, are they a population on their own 
or are they simply just a phase in the galaxy evolution scheme? So that means that if we have major mergers, do you then they form an AGN dominated phase afterwards after you had a big starburst event, you create a massive black hole in the middle, which starts accreting and then starts use, uh, ejecting gas. And then does that in the end turn into these big elliptical galaxies forming uh, stars so slowly it's hard to measure? Um, the question is, is this a phase? And if so, what is the, the role of ULURGs in this uh, scheme? I have to point out this is a very, very simple model. Not all will agree with this. And many people say it's much more complicated, but it's basically just to tell you that it, it's unknown what ULURGs uh, are in this scheme. But if they are phased, then we should at least find something similar at high redshift. So what are the progenitors? So if we look at the star formation history, we know that these kind of rare high um, star forming galaxies contribute significantly more at, at earlier on. So around the peak of the star formation history, uh, around between one and a half to, to two, uh, maybe all up to three, we have this peak and they seem to uh, contribute with a lot more around 30% something. Um, other versions of this plot, uh, which is known as the Medal plot, uh, will have a flatter tail because we are uh, discovering galaxies a higher, higher redshift, meaning that some suggest that this tail is flattening out, but I'm not going to touch too much upon that, um, though we do find uh, submarine galaxies up at that redshift. So going to higher redshift is also always more complicated. You will see, you can't see the small structures in the same way. Um, you need high, like large exposure times to see them. But there's one thing that actually works in our favor when we look at high redshift, and that is the negative K correction. So there's a positive and a negative K correction. The positive, and like when we talk of magnitude, this is the other way around. So if you have a positive K correction, it means that your flux decreases with redshift. And if you have a negative K correction, it means that it increases with redshift. And this is um, easy to see um, when, when you look at an SED. So this little movie shows uh, an SED, which is redshifted. You can see the redshift in, in the top right, top left corner. Um, and the dashed line in the middle shows a fixed um, wavelength. So if you keep an eye on that, and then on the right hand side, you will see that this shows the flux at this specific uh, wavelength as a function of, of redshift. I'll see if I can start it again. There you go. No. No. There you go. So you can see the it shifts, but at some point around redshift one, the flux becomes almost flat. And that means that we can, if we observe at this wavelength, in this case it's um, around 850 micron, we can actually trace this gas and dust much further at, without losing too much flux, uh, which is quite key for us to um, discover them. So the first SMG was SMJJ, SMJ02399, very exotic name. Um, it was discovered about 20 years ago, a bit more than 20 years ago, uh, by Ian Smeal and uh, Rob Iverson. Uh, there's a bit of discussion in the community whether or not they are the first to discover them or others, but given that I've been working with you, I'm, I'm slightly biased on this. <laughs> um, it adds, it's at a redshift of 2.8, and it has a magnification of 2.5. And that means that this galaxy lies in the same line of sight as another galaxy, which then um, uh, amplifies the emission by gravitational lensing. Um, so this is the, the scooper map in submillimeter, um, and on the left hand side you will see that this is the same emission um, at 850 microns, and there's just one big blob. And if you then look at in the I band at the same position, you will see you don't really see much. Um, there's a source in the middle, but it's nothing special and nothing something that really catches your eye. Um, 
So as you can see, these are very big blobs and have for many years been known as blobology. So been unable to actually resolve these galaxies. So it's been more a question of getting uh, measures of the integrated properties of these galaxies compared to very detailed that you can do in ULUX locally. So even though we actually finding these at this point quite regularly, we have big samples now, um, they are still rare, relatively rare, um, and they're still very bright, uh, and they're actually still difficult for um, models and simulations to recreate in the number that we observed them, which is a bit interesting. Um, so we need to know more about these galaxies to be able to feed the simulations the right uh, information and tell them what to look for within the simulations to find these galaxies. So as I said, we've actually found quite a few and I'm going to highlight some of the surveys that's uh, been done with different instruments. There's been the um, SCUPA 2 and SCUPA at the JCMG, the James Clark Maxwell Telescope at Mauna Kea. Um, Herschel with Pax and Spire has done a great job as well finding uh, submuminal galaxies. La Boca, of course, at, at Apex, um, being a big part, and especially the, the ALAS survey. And then there's the South Pole Telescope at the South Pole, um, which observes a slightly higher uh, wavelength than the others. And this is one of the key things in these surveys, that though they, they find the same kind of galaxies, um, they can be difficult to compare apples to apples, you need to be aware that they have been selected at different uh, wavelengths, especially the South Pole Telescope, which has a significantly higher wavelength than the others. They usually don't qualify as submillimeter galaxies, but are known as dusty star forming galaxies because they're technically not selected in the submillimeter, which is a technicality and I'm not, I'm just going to call them SMGs from now on. Uh, there you go. One of the, the things that need to be pointed out here is that it seems like these surveys have different redshift distribution, not significantly different, but enough to, to kind of question. And it seems like, or one of the, the suggestions in why we have these slightly different redshift distributions is that the, the shorter wavelengths uh, are more sensitive to the lower redshift galaxies, while the longer wavelengths are more sensitive to the higher redshift galaxies. Um, the SPT sources are the one that is mostly an outlier um, and they are also the sample that are all lens, meaning that to find these you do need to have them at a redshift where you can have another galaxy uh, at the line of sight to amplify the, the light. So when you're talking about redshift distribution, this is both, this is a bit of a hurdle when you talk about these samples because though it can be fairly easy to actually pinpoint the galaxies in, in a scuba 2 map, for instance, getting the work of getting the redshift afterwards to actually know what in, where to look for these galaxies in redshift space can be very challenging. Um, the first go-to is usually to find the photometric redshift uh, by, uh, finding photome by measuring photometric points along the spectral energy distribution. Um, so at the left hand side here is an example from uh, Lissy Cook's um, paper in 2018 uh, looking at high redshift, uh, meaning about four galaxies in the UDS um, field. And on the, the right hand side is a more recent uh, CO, uh, SED fit uh, by Ukne, a student of Mark and Ian, uh, who had done a very good job uh, not just looking in the in the millimeter and sub millimeter range, but I've actually probed as far uh, into the infrared as you, as was possible with the current data for these given galaxies. So the differences that Ukne has done with uh, MACFIS um, means that those photometric redshift are a lot more robust than if you only have a few points, uh, like Lissy did in her paper in eighteen. It means that the photometric redshift has always been this kind of, you, you don't really trust them fully. Uh, but as we do get better and get more photometric data, they do come closer to the spectroscopic 
spectroscopic redshift, um, which is a lot harder to get because to get that you need lines and lines takes time and it's difficult to get that much time on telescopes to uh, do a proper job of finding at least two lines. One of the campaigns that's been very successful in this uh, is the SPT survey. So this is the star, uh, dusty star forming galaxies uh, um, discovered by the SPT. Um, this is Cy ALMA cycle zero, um, where I, th I think there's about 25 that has lines here. Um, these are lens galaxies, so you don't need very much time to observe lines, which is good. Uh, and that means that these are a lot more robust than the photometric redshift. So if you then look at the different sample or some of the samples with uh, redshift, both those with photometric and then with um, spectroscopic, we will see that there's a slight shift in the peak of the star from uh, the um, redshift distribution. Um, so the, the top, three and the bottom left uh, are photometric redshift and the SPT which is the lower right uh, are the SPT sources which are lensed and this is spectroscopic redshift. Um, so the difference in the median redshift here can be explained by the fact that this is two different ways of measuring the, the redshift or it can be explained by the fact that the uh, SPT sources selected at longer wavelengths are more sensitive to the higher redshift galaxies. So, just to sum up, as, as sub millimeter galaxies, they are very bright galaxies selected at sub millimeter ranges. They have stellar masses around 10 to the 11 solar masses. They're very turbulent and gas rich. Um, they form stars at somewhere between 100 and 1,000 solar masses per year, uh, which is more than the ULUX, which is one of the differences between them. Uh, they are quite dominant in the star formation history at their redshift, and they always found in the redshift higher than one. So the images here are from the Alma, La Boca, Isidefes, Submimila survey. <laughs> um, and these are Herschel and show very different morphologies of the sub galaxies as well. And I'm going to come back to that. So as I said, the, the star formation rate is quite higher for sub galaxies uh, compared to ULUX, but they're still the closest equivalent we have so far. But while major mergers are the, the main event that triggers star formation uh, activity within ULUX, it's unclear whether or not this is still are also the trigger at high redshift. A, comp a competing theory is that these galaxies are creating gas from the intergalactic medium through these kind of cold streams. Um, also because the, the universe is basically a bit smaller at that time. Um, but the question is which one is the dominant? And it's only now that we actually get to the point where we can start looking at these high redshift galaxies in more details and start exploring this scenario a bit uh, closer. So, of course, the big game changer in the study of sub galaxies is ALMA. And I, I don't think I really need to tell you much about ALMA. And I don't really think I need to motivate very much why ALMA is great and cool. But one of the reasons that I just want to point out is that with ALMA, we can actually go to very high resolution which at high redshift can be both a good and a challenging thing. So if we look at substructures, or we can actually start looking at substructures within ALMA, with ALMA at high redshift in these galaxies. So this is a short movie um, kind of combining different uh, observations at the same wavelength. So this is 870 micron observed at a redshift gal at a galaxy at a redshift about 4.4 and you can see how it slowly zooms in um, and you can see the beam size up in the top right corner. Uh, ignore the kind of rainbow-ish colored patches, that's just the color table that's kind of freaking out a bit. Um, but as we get closer we kind of get from this blobology where you don't resolve anything and you just see a big blob to something that looks 
a lot more like structure and in, in clumps. Um, and by eye, this look really impressive. It is very impressive, not just by eye. Uh, but now I'm going to tell you what the downsides of high resolution at high ratio is. Um, yeah, oh, sorry. The ULEX are clumpy, and we have for years thought that maybe the high redshift galaxies are clumpy as well. This is a paper by Mark in 2010 of the eyelash galaxy, a very, very bright lens galaxy. You can see the blobs on the line in the middle figure, um, believing that this were clumps within the interstellar medium. Um, and then also the more recent uh, of uh, the high redshift galaxy uh, lensed, uh, I now forget the number, SDP, I want to say 11. Uh, very impressive data where they can actually see clumps within the galaxy because it's so highly magnified. Um, in the bottom left corner, you will see uh, imaging by Yono in 2010. That one, I think, is a lot more questionable, what they call clumps here. Um, and I will, I will show you why now. So we followed up um, four galaxies at redshift uh, 2.4 to 2.8 um, at band seven. And that means that at this point, we can get the Z plus line as well. These four galaxies were selected because they had C plus and they were observed at 0.03 arc seconds. Um, so three of them are from the ALAS survey. So that's the ALMA follow-up of La Boga imaging uh, of the ECDFS field. And the fourth one is from the UDS field, also follow up by ALMA. Um, so these are the, the low resolution imaging. Um, and if we then add on and zoom in, then this is what you would see at 0.03 arc seconds, um, which is very small <laughs> and very hard to see. Um, and that is the downside that when you get to that high resolution, you do lose a lot of flux. Um, and if we then, if we compare uh, with HST imaging, um, I just want to point out that the only one that's actually a proper comparison here is ALS 73. Um, that one is actually the right out, uh, HST imaging. It, it is a compact AGN, while the others are here mainly to show that the ALS 61 kind of looks very smooth, uh, quite compact. Uh, ALS 65 looks a bit more extended, maybe a bit more disc-like-ish. Um, and UDS uh, 47 uh, looks a much more clumpy, extended, and maybe a bit more like a merger. But one thing is what you, what you see by eye, that this kind of smooth, compact, um, or extended and clumpy might not be the right thing. It might be just apparent and not what actually is there. Um, so if we just smooth this just slightly by UV tapering to 0.05, you see that a lot of this kind of substructure goes away, especially in, in UDS 47, where it becomes very smooth um, and the clumps kind of go away. So to look into this, because we might just see smooth disk which just appear clumpy. Uh, I ran some simulations in the, the CASA simulation tool, basically just assuming that we have a clump, uh, smooth exponential disk, and how would that then look at this exposure time and this resolution? And at the left, you will see that's the data of UDS 47. Uh, and on the right hand, you will see that this is a simulation of an exponential smooth disk. Um, at this resolution and exposure time, um, which suggests that we can see clumps is something smooth. So we just need to be careful that what we call clumpy isn't just a smooth disk portray portraying as something clumpy. Um, the same was done by uh, Jackie Hodge in 2016. She also had high resolution, um, not as high, I think it was 0.16, but you also saw something you would uh, characterize as substructures and clumps. Uh, that's two on the, the top 
row, um, while the ones just underneath are simulations of similar brightness at the smooth exponential disks. And this again shows that you, you can get the same kind of clumpy substructures or apparent clumpy structure, substructures with something that's actually very smooth. So smooth disk can appear clumpy at high resolution. Um, so that was the, the small sample uh, at very high resolution. Um, but now we have a higher, uh, have a larger sample um, of high resolution galaxies, not as high uh, resolution as 0.03, because we've really quickly found out you need to start with slightly lower resolution if you want to do something proper to begin with. And the, here, the Alma Scuba 2 UDS catalog has been key. So this is um, a catalog which is follow, Alma follow up of uh, Geech 17. Uh, it's a Scuba 2 cosmology legacy survey. It was followed up in cycle 1, 3, 4, and 5, uh, which has um, resulted in some challenging getting the, this similar uh, RMS and resolution. But it has resulted in a very big catalog. Uh, this is all the galaxies, a uh, little more than 700. Just going to do a small zoom in. Um, so they are ranked by uh, flux or Scuba 2 flux. And you will see that some of them break up into two or more pairs. Um, the same is true for the ALA survey. They also split up into more when they were followed up at high resolution with ALMA. Um, and it, it, at this point, you need the redshift to be able to see, say, if they are galaxies which are in some way interacting or whether or not they're just basically on the line of sight. Um, so redshifts are, again, key. Some of you will notice that there are a couple of blind, um, blank, sorry, maps, uh, this little zoom in. Um, they have been followed up in cycle five. It was a bit worrying that they kind of disappeared, but they turn out to be a lot more extended and a lot lower surface brightness. So you need to go to lower resolution to actually pick them up. So they are there. They're just not at this resolution. So this, uh, what is known as the AS2 UDS catalog, the Alma Scuba 2 UDS catalog, um, is one of the largest samples we have of submillimeter galaxies. And it actually means that we now can start doing something a lot more statistical um, with bigger samples than we've been done, we've done uh, previously. So what I've done recently as my last project in Durham was to study uh, the morphology, morphology of these galaxies. So I took, the highest signals noise around eight, which had been observed at uh, a resolution of 0.18, meaning that they were uh, marginally resolved. And that resulted in about 150 galaxies. Um, so if we just look at them, um, you can see that there's, uh, some of them are quite round, some of them a bit more elongated, um, suggesting that there's, there might be a, a range in morphologies in these galaxies. Uh, six of them, were actually covered by HST. Um, and here we then compare the stellar distribution with the dust distribution. And what is clear, um, and it's not really surprising anymore, we've known that for a few years, is that the, the dust and the submillimeter emission at 870 microns is a lot more compact uh, than the stellar distribution. But that the stellar distribution follows quite well the same kind of shape if you will, uh, as the dust continuum. So what we want to know is a bit more about the, the profiles and the axis ratio of these galaxies. So if we start in the, in the UV plane, and look at the amplitude versus UV distance, um, you will see here that the red dots are the composite of these um, 150 galaxies, um, and while it's compared to uh, profiles of a Sersic index of a half, one, and two. So when we saw this, uh, it was quite clear that they don't really converge at higher UV distance to zero. So I should explain this for those who don't really uh, work with these kind of plots. On the, the y-axis, we have the amplitude, meaning the flux, and on the x-axis is the distance from the center of the array and out. Um, and if you have a, a flat 
distribution, the flat curve, then it means that you're looking at a point source. But if you have this kind of uh, decrease of flux with increasing UV distance, then you have a resolved source. Um, and an N of half is similar to a, Cersic, um, a Gaussian profile, while an N of one is an exponential profile. Um, so what they're here compared with is I've taken, um, I created a disk of these, diff these three different Cersic indexes and then observed them through the simulation tools um, to know what kind of profile this would show in the amplitude UV plot uh, to compare with uh, what we see in the composite. So what we see is that our composite is actually closer to um, an N of one or an N of two than a half, which is interesting. Um, so this suggests an exponential profile. Um, and if we then, in the image plane, kind of fit them uh, to get uh, both the axis ratios, meaning the ratio between the major and merge axis, and a free fit to get the CERSIC index, it suggests that the CERSIC index is actually closer to one than this to a, uh, to a half of a Gaussian. But what's interesting is that if we look at the, the distribution of the axis ratios, then we seem to be missing or lacking all the round ones. Intuitively, we would assume that the ones that are round have the more surface uh, area. So they would be the one that would be the brightest and those you would be easy to pick up. Um, so the question is, why don't we get this high axis ratio? So what we looked into is, is this a question of optical depth? So if we assume that these are all disks, just to make it simple, and then if we see them at a viewing angle, meaning that we would see uh, less of the surface and therefore less of the brightness, if it was optically thick, um, then you would get the top curve in the green where you would, actually, you would see uh, all the bright ones very clearly. Uh, and it doesn't really seem to cover the same, follow the same kind of trend we see uh, in our axis ratios. And the same if you, if you put a thin optical depth, you, you get the same kind of trend that you don't really get the same kind of uh, downfall in the high axis ratios as we see uh, for our galaxies. So this doesn't, optical depth doesn't really seem to be able to explain why we don't see the high axis ratio around galaxies. Um, so the question is, are we then talking about something which has a different morphology, which is more triaxial? Uh, so you have triax uh, three axes with different length. So if we assume that, um, so we have a minor merger axis ratio, B over A, and then we have uh, the third axis over the major axis, um, and we compute that. So these are just basic uh, computations. There's nothing really uh, fancy, uh, we need to keep it simple given the lack of information we actually have. But even these simple uh, models seems to follow what we uh, see in the axis ratio distribution, meaning this kind of downfall at the rounder sources. So this suggests that we have an exponential profile with uh, a triaxial morphology. Um, so this has kind of sparked the, the thought that these might be bars within galaxies. So the, the inner core uh, traced by the submillimeter galaxy, uh, by the submillimeter mission is simply just the bar of a galaxy. And, and this um, theory or hypothesis is um, supported by high resolution imaging by Jackie Hodge. This is 0.08 resolution uh, ALMA of uh, six ALA sources where three of them show what you might want to call a bar in the center and then a ring around it. Um, of course, we, we can't say anything for sure with only three galaxies. So this needs to be followed up at high resolution to actually be sure that what we see are a bars or anything or something similar to that. Um, to explore this slightly further, we also stacked um, the images. So this is the, the brightness as a function of the radius, where you see this kind of bump in the middle where you have the, the galaxy, and then you see a slight 
flatter, more extended component out to the right around just above uh, one uh, arc second. So there's two curves here. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, there's two curves here. There's one where it's stacked in the visibility plane, so in the UV, uh, and then one in the imaging to be sure that what we saw in the images wasn't just artificial noise due to cleaning. And it suggests in both of them that we do have this kind of extended component. Um, and if we compare this with what had been observed at, with HST, so that's the, the, the stellar distribution and what has been observed with low JCO for some ALS sources, that's in the blue and the HST is in the green, then these two seem to be following the more extended component of these galaxies, which is quite interesting because especially the CO um, at the low J actually seems to be tracing a lot um, bigger extent of the galaxy and the molecular gas than the dust emission, uh, which seems to be confined very much to the center. Oh no, oh, well, that's an arrow. So this is a bit more of a compact and this is more of an extended uh, star forming component. Um, so with, uh, with UGNES um, SEV fitting, um, of these galaxies and getting the, the photometric redshift, we also get the star formation rates. So to explore this kind of hypothesis that we have uh, a star formation burst in the center in these bars, which are like funneling gas into the center, compared to a more extended, more quietly star forming disk, uh, we simply stack them um, in terms of the star formation rate. So that is listed in the bottom of these four plots. Um, it's quite difficult to see here, but if we zoom in slightly, you will see that the, the inner component actually has uh, a, a, is much brighter uh, at higher star formation rates than a lower star formation rate, suggesting that, that this, but this uh, central component grows and becomes brighter with star formation rates. Um, the, the extended component, however, is more or less constant uh, in these four, three plots, sorry, four plots. So it, it kind of suggests that we have a bar in the center uh, because it's best explained by the exponential profile and the traction morphologies, and that this bar somehow is fueling gas from the outer disk and increasing the starburst in the center. So then we come back to the, the golden question. Are we getting any wiser whether or not we are talking about major mergers or accretion flows from, from the intergalactic medium? Uh, not really, uh, because these uh, very smooth morphologies, we see both at very high resolution and at the point 18, which suggests bars, uh, suggest very isolated, smooth um, morphologies, um, which are best maintained if you have a smooth accretion from the intergalactic medium. However, none of the current uh, simulations are very often get to a star formation rate which we see in certain media galaxies. These are mostly found if you do major merger events. So though the morphology now suggests that maybe we have something a lot more smooth um, and, and more sustainable with an accretion flow, it's unlikely that that will actually give us the star formation we see. So I'm gonna leave you with my summary. Um, so the high resolution we see, um, you know, you need to be careful when you do very high resolution, you need to be careful what you wish for. What the, the subtractors you see needs to be high enough significance that you can actually trust them. And you need to be able to see them in not just a very high resolution, but intermediate resolution as well, uh, until I will trust them. Uh, because the smooth disks that we can simulate actually get the same kind of clumpy structures. Um, if we do a um, simple uh, it's, um, modeling, uh, it suggests that our distribution of uh, axis ratios is best described by direction morphologies which combined with the CERSEC index distribution of one suggests that maybe we have bars which are dominating the center of these galaxies. Um, so I'm just going to say thank you for your attention and just leave you with my summary. Oh, can we uh, clap?
great. Thank you very much. Um, that was very, very interesting. So, do we have any questions? Does anyone want to raise their hands? Yes. In, uh, Perfect, Alessandro, yes. Yes, first. so first of all, Ethan, I would like to congratulate very much for the fantastic work you have presented. <laughs> so the reason why I've been astonished is twofold. The first one, I've, understand, I've understood more in detail um, the fact that when you observe clumpy structures in high wretched galaxies, they do not always imply that the medium is clumpy. Yeah. And in fact, uh, I was reading this and commenting uh, a paper, Giant Star Forming Clumps by Evison appeared in um, the archive just last month. I was discussing this briefly with the Kirsten. And uh, so you have explained much better this and, and fantastic. But the second thing that I saw for the first time that you, that you can actually predict the existence of bars and uh, rings which according to me is really a, a very, very big uh, uh, landmark piece of work because I mean, we, we are able now, or, or we will soon be able to connect the dynamics of these very distant galaxies with the ones which we know in the local universe. Yeah. So I would like to invite you as soon as this bloody pandemic fades away, we, ha we should have a quite serious talk together with Kirsten because I have some ideas. Cool. about how to probe this further. Excellent, that would be great. Great, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Uh, right, do we have any other questions? Uh, raising hands or in the chat window, or if you just want to unmute your microphones and interrupt, feel free. I'm not currently seeing any hands. Oh, here we go, uh, Kirsten, go ahead. So, I also think this is actually really, really interesting, but I'm fully biased because it's done. <laughs> Uh, and so one of the things that is also very interesting is because if one wants to link the submillimeter galaxies with other sort of is this a phase and in what kind of other sources does it connect so it would be very interesting to sort of see in as what way of other massive systems that one can really get the similar quality data um, that really links between of the distribution of the gas and again if we can see structures like bar or rings or things or thingies um can one like make some kind of a, um you call it some, like evolutionary sequence where they sort of link the different populations together because i think that that would be like this is where we can really get the answers as well and especially if we can link them with the agns um yeah. so I, I agree. I agree. Uh, it's more just a support. I think this is. Yeah, really yeah. Cool. Just need to get Alma excited about the Alma. Yes, okay. We need to know the Alma deadline. So. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Oh, Kay has a question. Go ahead, Kay. Uh, hi. Um, you probably showed this, but I missed it. What is the uh, size of these uh, structures that 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 you res you resolve? Because I mean, at redshift two or three, this will be I don't know, kiloparsec size or yeah, they're, they're still quite big. Um, so I think there's a uh... so so we're not talking about sort of a one clump of star forming region. You're talking about a, a sort of well, so so the galaxy, the 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 central one kiloparsec ring or whatever that are actively forming stars. So these are quite, these are high redshift. These probe about down to, I think, it's about 200 parsec or something like that. Uh, but the, the, the more extended study of the 150 galaxies, uh, they are more of a kiloparsec scale ish. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so because the resolution is, is well, 0 0.18 instead of point. Uh, or three and the lower resolution usually. Uh, so we, we're talking about kiloparsec scales, yes. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, any more questions from anybody? I don't see any hands. Uh, I don't see any messages in the chat window. Uh, no one seems to be interrupting. 
So I'm going to give this one more. Nope. Okay, great. Let's thank Bitten again for her wonderful talk.